And so what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about the southern part of Norway. We're going to be down here in Oslo, which uh, was quite interesting. It was originally named Oslo back around the 1300s. And then uh, Norway, if you read in the handout, Norway became part of Denmark in the late 1300s and was part of uh, Denmark all the way until 1814. Now the Danes are an interesting people in that uh, there's two pages, two sides. Okay, I hope. I had more trouble last night printing that thing uh, on two sides. I finally, yeah, well see, some people have it printed on two sides. You got two pages. I got fed up. <laughs> it just I wasn't want to feed. Uh, if, uh, if there are some additional people here, I ran out at 20. I, at 1 o'clock this morning, I said, that's enough. I wasted so much paper. Well, the, the color is kind of nice. But there's one couple. Oh, there's, they've taken it. That's great. Oops, I have one up here, too. Here's another one. If anyone needs it. Okay. Could you pass that back, please? But uh, the point is, uh, this part of Norway is only a small part. It's a fairly large country, as you saw on the back side. Norway was really part of Denmark for well over 400 years. And the Danes, as I said, are kind of an unusual people. When they name, or when their kings take on a name, they don't seem to take unusual names. It's Christian Frederick. Christian Frederick, Christian Frederick, Christian Frederick. And one of the Christians decided that he thought he, this country that he's ruling, Norway, ought to have a city named after him. And so what they did is they renamed Oslo into Christiania. And so my ancestors on my mother's side, when they came, they sailed from Christiania. Then in the 1920s, they changed the name back to Oslo. So you got a little history lesson. Uh, well, what I'd like to do is to take you on a trip. Uh, I assume this is Lincoln Sen Senior Center, isn't it? I want to make sure I got to the right place. And what we're planning on doing is taking you on a trip to Norway. Uh, you might be interested in the flag. It's the Christian cross. And I can give you examples. Those of you who are of Swedish background, isn't it the Christian cross on a flag? but it's a blue field and a golden cross. Or if you go to Finland, well, you now have no, a number of Finns living in Stevens Point simply because they're associated with that big company, Stora Enso. Stora means big. Stora Enso. And they come from Finland. And the Finnish flag is white with a blue cross. Or the oldest flag in all the world that's been continuously used since the 900s is this flag without the blue. That's the, uh, the Danish flag. It's called the Danaborg, just like ours is called Old Glory. They, their flag is called the Danaborg. And since Norway had been a part of Denmark for so long, when they adopted their flag right after 1814, they took the blue, the yellow, excuse me, the red and the white, and they put a blue stripe or a blue pinstripe on it, which mimics the same colors as the United States of America. And there has been that strong association between Norway and the United States. Uh, there's one other flag, and that's of Iceland. And Iceland is a Christian cross on a field, but the field is blue, and the pinstriping is white, and the center is red. So it's the reverse of the Norwegian colors. And so you have this whole set of Scandinavian countries that have very, very similar flags. Norway is a very long country. You have a little map in your hand, which was, by the way, printed in the United States, so we'll have a comment on that. Uh, there's that big one over here that we're looking at, but look how long Norway is. It's about 3,000, 3,500 miles long. And the map that you have in your hand, you'll notice it's tilted over. If you go from Sherkinis, which is way up here in the north, right about five miles from the Russian border, and on the map you have, if you drop straight south, it's right over Helsinki. And so they've always said that Norwegians kind of lean a little bit to the east. <laughs> this map, of course, doesn't quite show it that way. We're going to start out here in Oslo. There is a boat, by the way, that picks up in Bergen and goes all the way north. 
that takes about seven days on that boat to go all the way to Sherkinus, and there's a boat leaving Bergen every day, 365 days a year, there's a ship leaving Bergen. And it takes seven days, and every day there's a ship going south from Sherkinus. And this is a constant system of transportation for people, for goods, because once you get above the Arctic Circle, which you have on your map, it's somewhere right about in here, um, there are no roads. The only way you get to some of these little towns up in here, and I think a lot of people have heard of Hammerfest, that's the home of all of the uh, polar bears, uh, that's way above the Arctic Circle. And the only way you get there is either by sea or by air. There are very, very few roads up there, and the roads I don't think our 18-wheelers could get to. <laughs> Uh, we're going to take you on a trip from Oslo to a place called Rukan, which is not on your maps, a little tiny town. We're going to then take you to Bergen. We're going to take you to Trondheim, and then eventually to Oslo again. So we're going to make kind of a circle trip here. I was told that you would like to see a little bit of this country of Norway. By the way, I see some people wearing green today. I would assume that's in honor of leftover Norwegians from, in Ireland. <laughs> Didn't the Vikings come? And they just ravaged Ireland for about 200 years, and then they finally said, you know, this isn't such a bad place, so they came to stay. And it took a long time before and St. Patrick realized he didn't run the, what was it, the mice or the rats out. He tried to get rid of the Norwegians. <laughs> uh, but uh, some of you are wearing green. How many here, though, are, really have some Norwegian ancestry? Well, there are four, five of us. Uh, the rest of you, this will be informational then. You folks were born with this. And we're going to come back to Oslo. And this is supposedly the land of the midnight sun. I can tell you that Louise and I, some years ago, took this trip from Bergen all the way up to the top to Sherkinus. And uh, we'll have some pictures that we can show you of that. Before you take your trip, you've got to get ready. And this is uh, in our bedroom, and Louise is getting everything ready to go. She didn't take her boom box. She left that at home. But everything else you see here was taken along. Uh, we got on a KLM flight, and for me, it was very interesting. Notice the name of this particular, the Marie Curie for a science. That was great. <laughs> uh, and we flew directly. At that time, KLM would fly directly from Minneapolis over here all the way across right to Oslo. And yes, you'd be spending most of your time over land. But much of it's over Canadian airspace, a little bit over this part of the North Atlantic, and then a little over Greenland, and then you'd kiss Iceland, and you'd drop into Oslo. It's kind of like a great circle route. But if you notice again on the back side, where is Norway relative to the North Pole? Well, it says it's about 60 degrees north. In other words, if the equator is zero, and you start moving your way up to the North Pole, which is 90 degrees north, Oslo's at about 60. What are we here in Stevens Point? Somewhere in the 40s, but actually we're 42 degrees. I think it's 42 degrees, 10 or 15 minutes. So we're much further south. How come these folks are so nice and warm up in here? We were up in Tromsø, which is right about at the Arctic Circle, and I'm told that they grow apricots and peaches. Sure, it's the current. It's that when we were visiting, they said, oh, you're Americans? They thought at first we were British. Oh, you're Americans, thank you for your Gulf Stream. Because a lot of stuff starts way down here in the lower left-hand corner and works its way up and bathes England, bathes the coast of Norway, and makes it very temperate. We were at 72 degrees north, standing in a place called North Cape or Nord Cup on those uh, maps. And it was 88 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. We called back home and they said, well, no, it was a nice summer day, but it was only about 80. And here it was 88 up there, much further north. Uh, again, this is the, uh, the countries. This is taken from a Norwegian book. And you'll notice some of the spellings are a little different. See, they got that little ring over the A. Uh, there is a slash through this last O. There's another slash through that last O on Trumpso. Um, this is, Sverige is the name of Sweden in 
that's uh, language. Finland is the Swedish name for that particular area. If you collect stamps, you'll notice that Finland doesn't have F-I-N-L-A-N-D or F-I-N-N-L-A-N-D. They have Siomi, which is the name of the country in the Finnish language. And this, you can tell, is an old map because it still has the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet Union, these nations down in here are all broken up into the Baltic states of Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia. Well, again, let me tell you, we're going to start out in Oslo, we'll go to Bergen, we'll go up this coastline, we'll go to Trondheim, we'll wander on back. And let's see if we can't get going. Louise and I took that flight, we got ready, I rented a car, uh, and Louise and I took off driving the countryside. This is driving through one of the counties of Norway. Norway has 19 counties. Uh, we would uh, translate, I guess, to states here. I mean, they have that kind of civil authority. And one of them is called Telemark. Now, you've probably heard of Telemark here in Wisconsin, haven't you? And what happens up in Telemark and Cable, Wisconsin? What's the name of that event? The Birkebiner, or in Norwegian, the Birkebiner. Berke is birch. Beaner, that's that part of your leg, that lower part of your leg. And there's a famous story, if you've ever been up to hear that, a small baby was going to be saved from execution by another political group. We won't go into which country that was, because I have to have a quiet night's sleep tonight. <laughs> Remember, Louise's parents are from Sweden. Well, the Swedes were after the Norwegians again, and they were after this little uh, baby. And to protect him, two men skied for 50, the equivalent of 56 miles with that baby on their back. And they transferred through the snow and through everything else. They were members of a political group that was against or trying to uh, establish Swedish rule. And they were extremely poor. I mean, they didn't hardly have any clothes. And so what they would do is they would wrap their legs in birch bark. Birch legs. Berkebiner. And that became a political party in Norway in the Middle Ages. And today we celebrate that event by the Berkebiner here, or Berkebiner. And uh, in Norway they celebrate it also. But there you have to do classic skiing. And there's 40,000 people taking part in that event every year. I mean, it's mass hysteria. Well, as I said, this was uh, traveling through Telemark is the name of that area. The roads, this is not a backcountry road. This is a main road. There aren't that many uh, traffic jams. And there's lots of signage along the way. Uh, it was just great. We stopped in Kongsberg, uh, which is a very nice city. That's where a lot of the copper in Norway is mined. And as a sidebar to that, you know, recently we had the Statue of Liberty refurbished. The Statue of Liberty is an iron core of uh, all kinds of girders and so forth, but the entire object, the, the, the lady, is made out of copper. Where did the French, who were the um, givers of that particular statuary, where did they get all this copper? That question has been an interesting question over many years. Well, being a chemist, I read, uh, oh, about 10 years ago, they did an analysis on some of the copper, the leftover copper, and even some of the copper taken from the statue. They did what's called neutron activation analysis, which looks at copper, and copper has several different isotopes. In other words, you got the same atoms, but they just have different masses. Okay? Two, the same element with two different masses, those two different masses are called isotopes. And those vary from source to source across the world. And they were able to identify that all the copper in the Statue of Liberty was mined in Kongsberg back in the you know, mid-1800s. I told you we're going to go to this little place called Rukan. I'm sorry about this puppy here. Let me put them down here. Uh, Rukan, when I saw this sign, I said, Louise, let's spend the night here. So we drove into this valley. She, of course, was wondering, why in the world do I want to go into this valley? Those are very steep sides. This is Rukan in Telebark, and I'd have you notice that there is a natural shelf here. Many years ago, there used to be a railroad along that, because further south, or for, uh, actually, which way are we looking here? We're looking south, so it must be further north on that shelf 
there was a building. Not this one, this is downtown. You can see how steep the sides are. Um, and we stayed in this wanderer's home. I think we today would call the, uh, I think there's another name for them, pensionat. Uh, oh, it's a bed and breakfast. Uh, or hostel. I think that's a better place because we went in there and my Norwegian is terrible. Louise speaks fluent Swedish, but sometimes the Swedes and the Norwegians don't understand each other. And we couldn't figure out how come there was no linen? How come there was no, oh, well, there was a pillow, but there was no cover over it. How come there were no towels? Well, I mean, it was a true hostel. You were expected to bring your own linen. And so Louise kept going in and trying to say, well, can we get some soap? Can we get some uh, washcloths? Well, they don't use washcloths over there. I, I found that out. But anyway, after much uh, con conversing back and forth, we finally got some washcloths and some linen and, and all the rest. This is a great little place. Stream running, that river is running right behind us. But the rocks, it's, it's really a mountainous, ruggedous country. But that's on that shelf that I was talking about. There's this huge building. And it's a hydroelectric plant. At the time it was built in 1910, it was the largest hydroelectric plant in Europe. It supplied enough electricity for the Norwegian needs to take care of almost all of southern Norway. Rukan's right about in here, in that southern part. Uh, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there are pipes running down. And again, on the back side or on the narrative side of your handout, a large portion of Norway is glaciated. Huge glaciers with constant runoff. And so back at the turn of the last century in, in 1910, they made use of a lot of that. This particular uh, hydroelectric plant is no longer in service. It's now an industrial workers museum. And the name of the place is Vimork. Uh, you can probably make this, I have a grandson by this name, Gunnar. Uh, but it's Gunnar's Siversstadt. It's Seaver's place, way, or V, or V in is way. Uh, to get across that gorge, they've built this bridge. And if you would like some time to sit down and just enjoy a good movie that doesn't have a lot of sex and violence in it, that's, you know, one bag of popcorn and some liquid refreshment, find the heroes of Telemark. The heroes of Telemark. It's about two hours, um, and it features this bridge because, well, we'll get to that in a minute. That's the gorge. It's about 500 feet. Can you remember that? About 500 feet. There's a gorge. And over on the left-hand side is that shelf where they used to have a railroad track. And Louise's hand is sticking out the car here. She's looking down this gorge. There's some kids right in the middle here. Guess what they're doing? Yes. Bungee jumping. When, when Louise walked across, here's a 13-year-old girl standing uh, on a box getting ready to step up to the edge to leap over on this bungee. And Louise is scared to death. She says, where's your mother? <laughs> the, uh, the young lady told her, my mother doesn't care. Oh, man. But that's a 500-foot drop. And it's almost sheer down. And here is a, uh, this isn't our picture, this is from a postcard. Here's the building as it looked probably in 1910 and as it looks roughly today. Here are the pipes carrying the uh, runoff. It comes into the building, it runs some generators, spills out, goes into that river, goes down to a uh, lake called Lake uh, Tinshan. And inside are these huge generators. Now, uh, this is no longer being used today. It's, a, as I said, a museum. But I'd like to take you back to about 1943. That's what that Heroes of Telemark movie is about. Because the Germans who came in and occupied Norway in the spring of 1940, there are several reasons why the Nazis wanted to take Norway. First and foremost, Norway had tried to be neutral again, as it had been in the First World War. But some events had transpired that showed that Norway could not enforce its neutrality. And so Hitler and the general staff decided, well, Norway says it wants to be um, somewhat neutral, but they're really not. They're siding with the Brits. Reason number two, for some unknown reason, Hitler thought that if the Allies ever did try to overtake the Reich, 
that they would come through Norway. He, he, never in a million years did he think they were going to come through France. And so they garrisoned approximately one quarter of the Wehrmacht in Norway, all during the Second World War. Norway had about one German soldier for every ten people. It was amazing. The third, and as a scientist, we think it's because of that hydroelectric plant. If you tear water apart, what's the formula? H2O, okay? So in other words, that's hydrogen and oxygen. So if you put electricity through it, up bubbles hydrogen, up bubbles oxygen. However, water is more than just H2O. There's an itty bitty amount that's a little heavier. Remember the isotope business? There are some hydrogens that are twice as heavy as the other ones. There aren't very many. So as you boil off or generate hydrogen and oxygen, the water that remains behind becomes richer and richer in a heavier form of water. We call it heavy water. And the Germans thought that if you were to get a large quantity of heavy water, you could use that to slow down what are called thermal neutrons and be able to split the atom, namely the uranium atom. They had the same technology as we had, except they had the wrong idea. So they, this is the only place in the world that you could get heavy water on a large scale. And so hear about it in that movie. And this gentleman right here, Knut Hockerlid, led a group of Norwegians resistance fighters. They dropped them in by uh, airplane into an area that we're going to take a, a, a little further west from Rukan. And in 1943, the 28th of February, these guys on skis came up to that chasm, went down, went across the river, climbed back up the other side. Nobody believed that they could possibly do that. The Germans had garrisoned right at that bridge an entire brigade. And here these Norwegians came down, across, up, went over, and blew up the electrolysis cells and escaped on skis to Sweden, because Sweden maintained its neutrality. It's an amazing story. If you like to read, that same story is written by Knut Huckelid in Ski for Atoms is the name of it. But we had a chance to go there. Louise had no idea why I wanted to take her to Vimuk, but we had a great time. We really did. This is from a postcard. I believe this is 1943. And the electrolysis part was right here. This is what eventually got blown up. Uh, using a little Norwegian, this is a uh, girl from Telemark. And they have this kind of costuming. In Norwegian, it's called a bunad, B-U-N-A. B-U-N-A-D? Okay. B-U-N-A-D. And uh, it's a ceremonial dress that's used by a lot of people in different areas. And the colors, and the, if you go into the Gubrins doll, there they have lots of scotch plaid, and there's a reason for that. Little kids, if, the, if it's a particular day, I thought this was a great picture. I really did. One of my better ones. This is T-W-O, no, two. In Norwegian, it's T-O. It means the number two. Two Norwegian little girls. Uh, Otta, some of you might know Arne and Sharon Moga. Uh, he was the librarian at Spash for many years. He was born and raised in Otta, this place up here, Otta. Uh, the Moga farm is right around the side of this corner, if you follow along the fjord here. And um, this particular area was just purchased uh, by the Finns, the uh, zinc and mining area. Uh, and they make copper and zinc in this particular area, primarily zinc today, and there's lots of orchards. Uh, this was a picture that I put in simply because to remind me that at the time that we were in Norway last, we only had four grandchildren. So I tell my son, uh, Kevin, and his wife that this is what you're going to look like in a few years. <laughs> he loves to fish. Norway is noted for these kinds of places. In Norwegian, it's called Stavkjerka, Stave Church. And the staves are really wooden structures with planks held together in a U-shaped channel, and they're usually vertical. They're usually vertical. At one time, there were hundreds of these throughout Norway. Now there's about 30 left. Back in um, 19, or no, uh, 1998 or 99, Louise and I were in Norway, and we heard that the, a group of Satanists 
were trying to destroy the churches by firing them because they're all in wood. And this is original wood in most cases. Uh, this one is uh, a place called Roldal. The Roldal Stavsher uh, first mentioned in documents in 1462, but it's suspected that it may have been built as early as the 1200s. And they're still there. Now obviously they've been refurbished and so forth. The reason I want to bring this one, look how unusual this is. This is the only one where they're horizontal in all of Norway. Many times if you're driving along, and remember we're on our way from Oslo to Bergen right now, you're crossing rivers, you're crossing lakes, um, that's your major mode of transportation. In our trip in, in 2001, uh, we went through 88 tunnels and something like 30 different ferry rides we had to take. It's just like you, know, you drive up, give them your 10 bucks, they take you across whatever it is. This particular boat is a clamshell, it opens up on the front end or on the back end. In other words, there is no back or front. All the cars that are on here are going to pull out, coming from right to left. These cars are waiting in line, and they will drive in and go from left to right. And then they go across, dump the cars, another group comes on, they can take trucks. Some of these are big enough to take a, uh, an engine, maybe a diesel engine, a locomotive, and two cars after it. It's a, tremendously efficient, and they run on the minute. And if you missed it by a minute, you wait. <laughs> Does anyone know the definition of a fjord? We have fjords here in the United States, typically up in Alaska. But what is a fjord? It's a waterway. Pardon me? It goes out to the sea. But the definition I've heard is it's just as much up as it is down. There's as much down in the water as it is up. And there's typically no beach. It usually plunges right in. Now, there's not all of them are like that, but most of them are. And you can see from this picture, there's essentially no shoreline or beach. Well, we finally arrived at Bergen. Bergen's an old Hanseatic city. By that, I mean it's part of that German Hanseatic League, city-states. Norwegians couldn't even live in this town. They had to live outside the town during that era. Uh, very, very old buildings. They're extremely afraid of fire because they're all wood. Uh, the streets are extremely narrow <laughs> and up and down, up and down. When we arrived in Bergen, and I don't have a picture of this, we came in in a high area, we entered a tunnel, and it was all one lane, and we made uh, three turns. It was like a corkscrew. And we were still inside the mountain. We got down to the bottom, here was a stoplight to turn left or right. And our corkscrew went this way. What about the people coming up? There was another corkscrew inside. It was like a double helix. I'll tell you, the Scandinavians, they know how to drill holes through mountains. There isn't a Norwegian road engineer who knows how to draw a straight line. <laughs> uh, this particular uh, Sunday, this is just before we were going to get on our ship, we uh, came across this street that was all full of gravel. And I turned and looked up. And here is the famous cathedral in Bergen. And look at all this gravel on the steps. What in the world is this all about? This should have been a, a hint. That's a huge boombox. This is a Sunday morning. That's what they were doing. The young people were out there. They're on these uh, acrobatic bikes. And I was told by 6 o'clock everything will be cleaned up. The dump trucks will come, they'll put all the gravel in, and we'll be back to Monday morning business as usual. I thought that was pretty interesting. Well, there's our ship. Come, comes right into the Bergen Harbor. It's called the uh, M uh, Majesty Ship Polar Lease, which means North Pole or Polar Light. Whoops. Come on. Do something. And as I said, we're going to start here, or we're here in uh, Bergen, and we're going to work our way up. We're going to get off at Trondheim. This uh, particular group is called the Hertegruten. Hertegruten, uh, another name for it might be the Coastal Express, or it might be the Coastal Voyage. Or years ago, Doug Stroman, does anyone remember Doug Stroman? He used to be a Trinity Lutheran. When he was a teenager, he decided he was going to take the mail boat. Now, that's M-A-I-L boat and he took it from Bergen I don't know how far north he went uh, but th th 
it wasn't that expensive for us. You've also got to travel to, to get there, but it goes from Bergen all the way north and you can get off. It's just like getting on a streetcar in Chicago. You can get on at Trondheim and you can go up to Rorvik if you want. You just buy a coupon and off you go. Now we were doing things a little differently. Uh, this particular boat also carries uh, cargo. It's not a cruise ship because there are no, there's no live entertainment. It's good food. But uh, there's no live entertainment. Uh, the, I guess the Norwegian scenery is all you need 24 hours a day. Uh, this is a, a postcard that was set in there at our uh, stateroom. And uh, I'm not quite sure what all this means, but it's, it's in three different languages. Welcome in Nor German. Uh, no, well, this is, the first one's in Norwegian. Uh, welcome on board and bon voyage. Uh, welcome, this is in German and it was signed by the captain. And the reason for it was, and by the way, my name is C. Marvin Lang. I'm named after my father, whose name was Conrad. And in Norwegian, the Conrad starts with a K, and everybody uses first names over there. So it says, Shatter, or Dear Louise and me, Mark Conrad, congratulations and um, heartiest, uh, or heartiest congratulations on your 40th uh, wedding anniversary, Brulupstag. Uh, I'll wish you a good trip with Vent Fenley uh, greetings, uh, welcome on board, and this is the Polar Lease uh, uh, state, pe the people who are running the ship. So it was a nice touch. Huge ship. Lots of stuff being loaded on, pull motors. I mean, in the seven days that we were on, I think we stopped at about 40 different ports. So they come in. The side of this boat opens up, they start running all the stuff in and out, close it up, and off they go again. Some places they'll stop for six hours. And so you can take excursions and visit the, the cities or the villages. We even put our car on. There's our car on there. And uh, stateroom is, it's not luxurious, but it's certainly uh, enough. This was stateroom 648. And what do you, which, what do you think uh, Louise's stateroom was? 648 too. <laughs> It is a little, for us anyway, it was a little unusual, unusual to be flying under another flag, the flag of another country. Uh, this is the entryway, the reception area. I mean, this is luxurious. You have a full crew. Um, there are, whoops, let's go back. There are one, two, three, four, five, six decks, and it's only this deck and this deck for passengers. The rest is cargo and hold. Uh, all the safety equipment, Thinking ahead and knowing my wife's desires, we always made sure that we could see land. Because you're always, you know, we're going north, so I said, let me put it on the right-hand side. And I still can't keep starboard and port correct, but we were on the right-hand side going north. But uh, full safety features, oh, come on. Oh, I'm going the wrong way here. Push the right buttons, Marvin. Uh, there were lifeboats. We had to have a lifeboat drill. You notice it's totally encased. Um, we got instructions on how to do this. This gentleman was saying that there's enough of these uh, packs going to be inside that if we were at sea for as much as five days, there's going to be enough food and water. Um, it's not terribly comfortable in there. Um, this is probably the best picture because you would sit on this place and you would put your feet down here or you would be sitting, for example, here and put your feet over the next person in front of you. So you're kind of sandwiched in like... Uh, anchovies or sardines in a can, but it's their way of keeping you safe. A phenomenal bridge. This was a relatively new ship and it's all the modern technology. Everything's run by computers these days. Uh, GPS, all kinds of sonar. It's amazing. Uh, one of the cities, and I think that's on your map, it's called Ulison. An A with a ring over it is almost like two A's put together almost has an O sound to it. So that's Olesen. This city was totally destroyed when the Germans pulled out in 1945. And most of the coastal cities and villages will have some sort of remembrance. And this is to those who are going from, 18, from 1940 to 1945 who were going on the open sea and getting to Scotland or getting to Ireland or getting to England and getting supplies, munitions, and bringing them back clandestinely. It's a very, very uh, 
interesting thing to do to go to an occupied country that has now recovered. This is what the city looks like today. And that statue that Louise was standing at is right in here. It's a whole new city. It's been built up since 1945, Ulison. This is called the Gerdanger Fjord. It's probably the most beautiful of all the fjords in Norway. Again, it brings out the idea that it goes down as much as it goes up. Very, very deep. It took probably four hours by that big ship to w wiggle its way in there. Uh, a particular waterfall that I found interesting is called the Seven Sisters, and they give you seven different waterfalls here, or sources, and they give you all kinds of uh, legends associated with that. Uh, we got off, we went up uh, on some sort of a bus, come, came all the way to the top. Uh, we were standing there just to get our picture taken, but uh, I think this is one of the best pictures I've ever taken. But as there's Seven Sisters again, there's our boat leaving, because they left us up on top. We got on a bus. And we were gone seven hours winding through the countryside and we're going to meet up with our ship at another city They're called Mulda. That's two minutes after the previous picture. This is the area that these uh, Norwegians were dropped in by a plane and when they were going to fight the Germans and take the ski down the, the chasm and so forth. It's called the Hardanger Vida Desert. And <laughs> it's just incredible. <laughs> It really is, and it goes on for miles. And then once you get into it, we've just left it. Now we're going to take our bus. It's going to go this way, and then it's going to come this way, and it's going to go this way, and this way. I don't remember how many hairpin turns. And there were five buses following each other. The first two were German speakers. There were two English speakers, and there were very few Americans. It was mostly uh, Brits. And the last one was Norwegians. And we had someone talking in the microphone telling us about the countryside and how many turns there were, how wide it was, and so forth. And oh, by the way, we just got Oli as our bus driver. Let's all give Oli a round of applause. He just got his license yesterday. <laughs> I was sitting at a window seat, and I swear, you know, those double tandem wheels that they have, I swear one of the wheels was actually off. It was great. I mean, it was like going down the roller coasters. <laughs> And it's called the Troll Stegen Bay, and they even have uh, these signs for trolls. <laughs> and we went to Molda. We finally got to Molda, got back on our ship, and continued on. That's my wife. But her youngest son had given her these shoes. And she just loves those shoes. What do you call them, Louise? Yeah. Oh, saddle shoes. That's what they are. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful time, sun decks. Uh, there were more sun decks than we knew what to do with on this place. But again, this, we went in June. And so uh, the sun is up. Remember the land of the midnight sun? That's because we never saw night. There was no night. We got above the Arctic Circle, the sun will continue to be well above the horizon. We just had a great time. We finally get to Trondheim. This is called the Nidaros Cathedral or Domscherken. Um, my dad is from this area. Uh, the biggest city was Trondheim. This is the Cathedral of the North. It was the largest uh, cathedral in all of Northern Europe. Larger than anything in Germany. All the kings of Norway and of Denmark in that period of time were always crowned here. It's absolutely amazing. But look at the front facade. And the carving. All the apostles all of the saints are shown in here, in statuary. Of course, there's one, uh, Olaf Tryggvason, who's mentioned in the little write-up I gave you. Um, he gave you a choice. You had three choices. You could convert to Christianity, you could be exiled, or you could lose your head. <laughs> Those are your three choices. And one of these has a picture uh, or a statue of Olaf Tryggvason, and he's got a basket, and guess what's in the basket? Your three choices, three heads. <laughs> Very interesting. We climbed up it. You can see the fjord out here. Because uh, Trondheim is not on the ocean. It's on an inlet in the fjord. It's a reverse L, and it's right at the corner in the L. And this area across is called Fossen, and min father food i Fossen. My father was born over there. Uh, the Archbishop of uh, Nidaros Cathedral essentially had his own army, and this is the area that his army would be 
uh, bivouac during uh, peaceful times. They love flowers in Norway. You will see many, many orchards and flowers because their period of time is almost identical to what we have here in Stevens Point. Uh, we've talked with people in Sweden and in, uh, in Norway and in Finland within the last two weeks. They've had a very, very mild winter until about the latter part of February. Then they get dumped on with snow. Louise was what, called me in to watch television last night. Uh, I don't know how many Iraqis have asked for political asylum in Stockholm. And so they had a group over there showing uh, these, all these refugees coming in. They have little suitcases, short sleeve shirts, and there's about a half a meter of snow out there in Stockholm. That was yesterday. This is a very famous bridge in downtown Trondheim. It's called the Old City Bridge, Den Gamla Bibro. And there's a very famous song about Den Gamla Bibro, which my father always loved to sing. Uh, this is from the back side, but does anyone know who that might be? Leif Erikson, you betcha. There's a huge statue. This was donated by the Sons of Norway out of Seattle to Trondheim in 1997. It was the thousandth anniversary of the founding of the city of Trondheim during which Leif Erikson asked permission to go on a voyage of discovery. He had heard that there might be some land on the other side of Greenland. And so he's looking west. Of course, I say he's looking over toward Fosten, looking at where my father came from. But uh, you could subscribe, you could send in money to help them build a statue, which my wife and I did. And part of that, this is a, from a postcard, uh, the carving is imma immaculate. But uh, we took our pictures and so forth. But if you donated, then you could put your ancestor or your relative on a plaque. There's these two by two uh, plaques all the way around that thing. And if you look down here, here's an Arne Konrad Langergen, and he uh, came in 1923. That's my dad. And Louise and I had to go over to Langergen Gord, Langergen uh, Farm or Manor, and uh, that was 1.6. I have a picture of my grandparents and some of their, uh, his uh, siblings. This is my uncle, yes, I have an uncle, Uli. Uh, my grandfather, Selmer Theodorius. This is my grandmother, Ulina. My aunt, Olga. My other uncle, Edvard. Papa. He was five years old there. And said she's in a white dress, this is when she was confirmed. So I can almost pick that date out instantly because she had to be 14. So it's a, an interesting farm. My father was born, uh, I think this thing is dying. My father was born in this room up here. You can tell that there's almost like two farms here, isn't it? One's got a grass roof, one's got another. That building was cut in half. And a part of it was moved to another place. Because the word gourd is more than farm. It's almost like a manor, almost like uh, several farms, a nest of farms. And oftentimes they had a common, uh, uh, common walls. This is what it looks like today, and they've changed the spelling a little bit. This is an aerial shot, from, again, from a postcard. All that remains of the original farm, my battery is dead, is this little A-frame right here. This has been added, this has been added. I don't know about the outbuildings and so forth. Today it's being used as a dormitory for uh, young people who want to get out of drugs. There is no electricity. Yet they've got computers, they've got refrigerators, there's probably 40 or 50 people out there. Everything's done solar or wind. We have an awful lot to learn from our Scandinavian neighbors. Every kid in, um, in Finland has at least one cell phone and a pager. And they can get reception no matter where. We lose reception driving from here to Marshfield. I want to talk a little bit about the naming. I said my dad's name was Arnie Conrad. His, his actual name on, uh, in the church records is Arnie Conrad Selmerson. He was born on the farm Lungergen, and so that's his address. And those of you who are interested in genealogy, it is very, very easy to follow Scandinavian genealogy because you can see the son has the patronym Selmer son because my grandpa was Selmer Theodorius Anderson Lungergen. And his parents, the father's parents, 
were Anders Estensen Hulvan. So in other words, there's where the Andersen comes from. And his, uh, his, grand, his father in turn was Esten Jakobsen, and he came from the farm Scheisados. Or you can look at the other side. Here's my grandmother. Her death record in 1942 in the newspaper called her Olina Antonsdottir Vansvik. Yeah, she might be Frau Langergen, but her official name, the, the, the women didn't change their names. And right away you can tell, oh, her papa must have been Ander, or Anton. So it's very easy to follow these things. Yeah, the names sound a little unusual. Uh, my dad's best friend, his last name is H-O with a line through it, I-S-E-T-H. And the judge asked what he was taking out of his citizenship papers, did you want to change your name? He says, no, horseshit sounds fine. <laughs> uh, I love pickles because it's got a grandpa and he's always got his grandson. And he says, you want to take a walk, grandpa? And grandpa says, I'd like to, but someone has to sit here and keep this tree from falling over. Uh, the, his grandson's name is uh, Nelson. He says, have you been a good boy lately, Nelson? Yeah, I guess so, says Nelson. Good. A lot of people are counting on you. Like who? See, this is from the Sunday. There's lots of panels. Well, let me put it this way. You have two parents, each of which had two parents, and they had a total of four parents, and these are your four grandparents, of which I'm one. Uh, then there were eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, and 32 great-great-great-great-grandparents. If you figure... Now, this is for you, Ruth. Yes. If you figure... I knew you were going to be here. If you figure 25 years between generations, that's pretty good. Uh, only 500 years ago there were, let's see, and Grandpa leaning against this tree pulls out his little handy dandy calculator and says 1,048,576 people who all involved in the creation of you. <laughs> That's a lot of folks counting on you to make something of yourself, boy, so don't let us down. Look at poor Nelson. <laughs> Peer pressure is nothing compared to ancestor pressure. <laughs> I put this on my syllabus when I was teaching because I was teaching chem majors and paper sciences and engineers and all these people who are, you know, think they're pretty hotshot coming out of high school and I says, if grandpa can sit there with a calculator, can you do it? <laughs> and it turns out it's 2 raised to the nth power and in this case n is equal to 20. <laughs> so we're now going to go from Trondheim to Aldousness. Uh, there's these stones are raised all over to commemorate something. And this stone is commemorating things that went back to the year roughly a thousand. This is right outside of my, home, my father's hometown. The churches always hedge their bets. You'll notice there's dragon heads at the corners. Uh, we went to this particular place, which is called Romstofjord. Um, there's a reason for this. If you'll kind of remember this picture, Someone's made a painting of an invasion at that particular point where the Scots came into Norway at the behest of the Swedes to do something. All of the Norwegians were in the south fighting against the Swedes and here the Scots came in, these are Scots, came in to invade. 1612. And here is a remembrance to Peter Klugness. He was a Norwegian who was supposed to guide these Scots to the south. Well, he took them over that Hardanger Vida. And he took them, and they almost all froze to death in the middle of August. I mean, it was absolutely terrible. And then when they finally got to a particular point along a river, and that's a whole different story, the old people who were left behind from the fighting, the little kids, the mothers, they had moved this juggernaut of tree trunks and uh, boulders and stones high up on a cliff. And the Scots came walking around the corner, and there was a young woman across the way blowing on a horn. And when she changed her tune, see, they, the Scots were just, or um, their attention had been drawn to her. They weren't looking up, they were looking over there. She changed her tune, they knocked out the props, and this juggernaut came down, and the River Logan ran red with the Highlander's blood. 1612. Louise and I already have room reservations in that town for 2012 when they're going to have the 400th anniversary of the Battle of Kringen. But this is the guy who led them all over the place. And there's something about a, uh, an invasion on there. They should have gone through this town. They didn't. He took them around the outside. You can look at, the, look at all the stuff up there that he took them over. It was absolutely amazing. 
This is uh, Andel's nest in uh, Romsdal. Ships come right in. We're probably 50 miles, 60 miles from the coast. So you can see how those fjords work their way in. From there, this is the trip that we took. Whoops, let's go back. This is the trip that we took, and that's the, the area that eventually those Scots had to walk across. And it's roughly right about here is a place called Utta where they got annihilated. Uh, I'm going the wrong way again. But uh, the only reason this picture is in there, look how low the clouds are lying. Isn't that kind of neat? Uh, every place there's always signage. The thing that impressed me the most is, and it brings me back to the United States, I have gone to many, many cemeteries, and in those cemeteries, isn't there some sort of a marker, a stone? Since Viking times, even before the Viking times, there would always be the raising of a stone to commemorate something. And this is commemorating Olaf Tryggvason had walked this way umpteen years ago, thousand years ago. Uh, something had happened, this one I know is to the Second World War, the one on the far right. They've been raising stones. It's at, and right along the roadways. Uh, we stopped at uh, some places because my mother's people came from this part, or the Gubernsdal came from this part, and Louise with her command of Swedish, we'd stop, we'd knock on the door, we would say, what would we say, Louise? We thought we had some, we have relatives, or ancestors in the 1600s, and people are so gracious, they'd have you in for tort, you know, cake and coffee and pull out the genealogy books and just have a great time. This is, I want to build one of these for my granddaughters. I'd love to have one in my backyard. Uh, these buildings are still being occupied. Uh, this is not a church. That cupola is for a big bell that would ring so the husman, the people working in the fields, would come in for dinners uh, or they could use it for alarm systems. This is the inside of one of these. My ancestors at one time lived on this farm. It's no longer in the family. We walked in here, that clock is from 17, 1710 and it's still running. And the fellow who owns this place now says he's never worked on it. He's a lot older than I am. We found that economically to stop at these kinds of places, uh, room is the big word that you want, hitta. These are bed and breakfasts. And uh, we heard that people are paying two, three, four hundred dollars a night in hotels and so forth in the big cities, I don't think we ever paid more than 75 for the two of us and we had a breakfast, which is great. This is Stavsherk, uh, again, some of my ancestors on my mother's side come from here. This is probably one of the oldest churches in Norway. Uh, it's almost uh, impossible to get into it without passes and so forth because they're so afraid of uh, accidental fires or maybe people doing mischief. Again, the travel through the, uh, using the, the ferry system uh, you drive in, you drive off. We stopped at one particular farm that's in my uh, mother's ancestry, and I ran across this old man who could not, well, young man, who could not <laughs> speak any English, but he had this car that he takes uh, and uses for weddings. He loves to take, and he doesn't charge for it. Does anyone know what kind of car that is? A 1929 Studebaker Phaeton. They made 28 of them. And he's got one that's running around in Norway. <laughs> it's in excellent condition. This is my uh, dad's second cousin. He, was, he lived in the United States for a long time. They moved back to Norway, but he brought all his American cars. Uh, again, these are uh, ancient farms that uh, four or five hundred years ago, we believe some of my ancestors lived on. And uh, people are very gracious, very open. Uh, it's always wood. And I never saw forests that were, with, with, had trees that were that big. I don't understand it. This is the Gubernsdal, it's the longest valley in Norway, right in the center. That's that River Logan. It's up the, to the, way up at the back end up here that uh, the battle took place that I mentioned. Uh, these are some shots that we, uh, of living conditions. This one is also in my genealogy and we were told by this mother, this lady, that Norway changed their laws in 2001 to formally allow the eldest child to have first rights of refusal on the property. Up until that time, it was first right of refusal of the oldest male child. She has three little girls and 
she said, now my daughter will have this farm, and it's been in that family, I guess, for 300 years. We, Louise and I just happened to run across this particular farm. It turns out they had the ROM out by the road, and so we drove up, and we stayed in this bed and breakfast, and it was absolutely amazing. Great facilities, television, uh, your own bath. You know, what was it, 75 bucks? Nice big breakfast. This is in Hamar. You possibly heard of Little Hamar, where the Olympics were held. Uh, they're just like us. This was taken in uh, June. They love their pictures, and they love their uh, flowers, and cut plants and shrubs. Uh, Valhalla, that's this hall. This is supposed to be an upside down Viking ship. That's where the Olympics were held, in Little Hummer, in 1994. And there's a guy by the name of uh, Johann Olaf Kaus. He was a med student. He gave up medicine for a while to train. And he was a skater. And he won five golds in various forms of skating. And on the last one, it was almost as if it was a, uh, a religious experience because there was a blind deaf, uh, he had something else, a little boy, and all he could do when he was nudged is take the cowbell and ring it. And when the event was over, instead of Kaus going over to get his medals and so forth, what he did is he went by, picked up that little kid, and made a victory uh, lap. And this is why I'm doing it, because he wants to be a physician for young people who have these very unusual things. In the... Um, in the uh, airport the following year, Louise and I were there, and there's pictures all over. And in Norwegian it says, there is a new king in Norway. His name is Olaf. Christ uh, Olaf, Olaf something Kaus. Forgot now, I, I knew it a moment ago. Uh, we're now back to Oslo. This is the center of the city. There is a park there. It's called uh, Frogner Park. And there, within the park, there is this uh, memorial, the Vigelin Memorial. It's the greatest number of statues ever assembled in one place by one man. And it's to humanity. They're all nude statues. Uh, he worked not only in stone, but he also worked in metal. There is this uh, obelisk to humanity. It's just people piled on top of people. I gave you this picture because this is King Håkon. He was the first king of Norway after it finally separated from Sweden in 1905. Uh, his son was very active in the uh, Norwegian military, fighting in the Norwegian military during the Second World War. And this was his son, who was the current king of Norway. Oops, went the wrong way again. Everybody keeps talking about this. The uh, word for holy is helige, H-E-L-L-I-G-E. And so while this might have a different connotation, everybody talks about going to hell. Uh, Louise and I have gone through this town. It's a lovely town. It's nothing like the real hell. I can tell you that. And so I think for world peace, we might consider uh, some of the sage advice that we get from the cartoons. According to Hagar, he says it would be a perfect world if only people all over the world would try to understand each other. And Lucky Eddie, with his little funnel on top of his head, says, you know, you're right. The problem is to get everyone to speak Norwegian like we do. <laughs> and so that is the end. Thank you.